we have been going through Psalms for the last two times. We saw Psalm 2, the introduction of the Psalm, how the Psalmist is viewing the Messiah, Jesus, who is to come down and establish his kingdom. Last time, we saw on Psalm 19, how to meditate on the scripture. Today, as we are going to walk along this Psalm 88, this is a very unusual psalm, the most tragic psalm of lament, or one of the saddest psalm of the Psalter. The psalmist cries here to the Lord for help, but he hardly sees any answer coming from the Lord. Only thing he meant the order of the psalm is seeing darkness everywhere. Everywhere around he sees in his life is full of darkness. So now he continues to ask for the help. It is easy for us to pray when all things are going well. But this psalmist is praying a very desolate psalm, very sorrowful psalm, when he is undergoing a tremendous sorrow in his own life. We know that psalms are songs. So this is either prayed or it is sung during the worship service of the early Israelites. Whenever they gather in the temple, they come and worship the Lord by singing psalms. The psalms are one of the hymn books of the Old Testament believers. But we see here the lament or, you know, the, the psalmists are crying. If, you know, we, we see that before we, uh, the, before we go for what is lament, the Hebrew title of the psalm is called Tehillim or the praises. But the majority of the psalms that we see in the scripture are, are laments. About one third of the psalms are lament. What is a lament? Bob Brockman says, lament is a form of praise and prayer with the intent of drawing closer to God in times of great suffering and pain. This lament is nothing but drawing ourselves near to God in desperation when we are undergoing tremendous sorrow and, and pressure, the intention of lament is coming into the presence of God with praise and prayer. Open your Bible or in the bulletin, Psalm 88. The main idea of this text is the godly cries to the Lord in darkness and despair. A child of God, a covenant person, who has been born again, cries to the Lord in his despair and in his hopelessness. So we are going to see three truths how the author cries out to the God during his hopeless situation. Number one, pray and prayer and the gravity of sorrow. How, you know, the, the weight of sorrow that is pulling the psalmist down. This we are going to see from 1 to 9a. Second is prayer and the glory of God. Even though this psalmist is being pulled down because of his sorrow, but his heart and his passion is towards glory of God, the praise of his name. And thirdly, this we will be seeing from 9b to 12. And thirdly, we are seeing prayer and the gloom of darkness everywhere, or the gloom everywhere, a darkness everywhere. This we'll see from 13 to 18. The three things, truths that we are going to see, one is the gravity of sorrow, the glory of God, gloom everywhere. This psalm is written by Heman, the Esrite. If you see on the superscription that is written, this psalm is written by Heman the Esrite. 
So what do we know about Heman? There are different Heman, but the Heman who has written this psalm is, we read from 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 31, he, Solomon, was wiser than anyone, wiser than Ethan the Israelite, and Heman, Calcol, Darara, sons of Mehal. His reputation extended to all the surrounding nations. We see here, Heman is one of the five wisest people among his generation, including Solomon. So, on his contemporaries, this Heman is one of the wisest man. The wisest man in his contemporary generation is writing, giving us the saddest or desolate psalm that we are going to see in 88. The psalmist knows only one thing in this lament, that is darkness in Psalm well, in, in verse 18, if we read, darkness is my only friend. Only thing that the psalmist is seeing in his life is dark. But he knows where to navigate his life in his darkness. So in his desperation, he turns to the Lord of salvation. He constantly cries to the Lord his Savior, despite of his great suffering. The psalm begins with a positive note of, God, you are my salvation. Lord, you are my Savior. But then, when the psalm is going to end, it is going to end with darkness. The psalmist is not going to see any kind of light in the tunnel. He is walking through the darkest part of his life. He is not seeing any light. There are psalms in other, other psalms in the Psalter where the psalmist is lamenting, but then there is a glimpse of hope. There is a glimpse of light. There is a glimpse of salvation. But then in this psalm, we see there is darkness everywhere. He is not able to see any light there in, in, this, in, this, in his life. So this passage, as we said already, divided according to the crying or calling of the psalmist. In 1, in verse 1, in verse 9a, and in verse 13, if we see there, in, in all these in a, in a, this words, we see that there is a repetition of crying towards God, calling upon God. So, words 1 and words 1 to 9. Prayer and the gravity of sorrow. Verse 1 and 2. Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out before you day and night. May my prayer reach your presence. Listen to my cry. The psalmist begins with a trustful statement that Yahweh is his God, or Yahweh is his salvation, the God who said to Moses, I am who I am. He, he is confessing that, Lord, you are my Savior. He believes that the covenantal relationship with God, no matter of his problem, the problem does not shift the psalmist to go after other gods. He is coming back to Yahweh and saying, Lord, you are my Savior. You are my God. So he remembers the covenant-keeping God of Israel and his promise. He remembers that the God of Israel visited the Israel when they were suffering. God opened the heavens and he came down to visit his people. God opened the Red Sea and allowed the people of God to walk in a dry land. So this psalmist, trusting in the promises of God and calling upon God, Lord, please come back again. Lord, I am in a sorrowful situation. Lord, I am in a deep distress. 
Lord, open your heaven and come back again and save me. So here we see the intensity of the psalmist crying. He says, day and night. Day and night the psalmist is crying, Lord. Lord, will you not help me? Will you not deliver me? It shows the intensity of his desperation. Lord, can you do it again? I am desperate. So listen to my prayer. We see in, in verses from 3 to 9b, For I have had enough troubles, and my life is near Sheol. I am counted among those going down to pit. I am a man without strength, abandoned among the dead. I am like a slain lying in the grave, whom you no longer remember, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest part of the pit, in the darkest places. In the depths, your wrath weighs heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have distanced my friends from me. You have made me repulsive to them. I am shut in and cannot go out. My eyes are worn out from crying. The psalmist says, Lord, I come to you with your promise that you are my salvation, but my problems are so heavy. My problems are so heavy that I am not able to bear those problems. It is so miserable. The weight of my sorrow pulls me down. Lord, I am like a person approaching the grave. The gravity of sorrow pulls this man of God, the man who pins his hope, in the Redeemer and the salvation, but then his situation is overwhelming in his heart that he's thinking in his life. What we do not know is, we do not know the exact circumstances of his suffering, but what we do know from the text is, this suffering that he is having is for very long time. In verse 15, if we read, he was suffering for a long time. From my youth, I have been suffering. So it could be thought that it was leprosy was one of their proposal as he was isolated from his friends. In verse 8, we read, my friends have been distanced. And in verse 18, loud one and neighbors have been distancing from myself. This condition has become powerless. We read in words in words 18 in, in words 4, this condition has become powerless without strength. And he his condition is friendless because there is no friend around for him in words 8b, leading to despair and hopelessness. There is there is no light for him in words. Six is full of darkness. Psalmist is experiencing lightless, friendless, and powerless. Is it, is it something that you can engage or I can engage this tone of voice? When we do not have power, we, when we do not know what step that we were going to put next, Lightless, and have you ever experienced no friends, even though there are so many people are around, but being isolated and becoming friendless without companionship? So this psalmist is experiencing in his life that he is becoming powerless. There is no strength for him. There is no, no light in his eyes to see the guidance, the counsel. And there is no friends. And he's saying this experience for him is leading towards grave. It's like a bed of grave. 
What is Sheol meaning in verse 3? You know, the, the nations during the Old Testament times were believing in different gods. The gods of heaven, earth and under earth. One of the areas called netherworld is called Sheol. But the psalmist who believed in the Old Testament God of Yahweh, they don't endorse the pagan mythology. The Old Testament clearly teaches the death of a person is appointed by the Lord. And in Psalm 139, words 7 and 8, we read that, Where can I escape from your presence? Where can I escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. The psalmist understands that Yahweh's presence is everywhere. But he is saying that the sinking of his sorrow, the problem that he has is that he is going down and going down and going down. We understand that God reigns everywhere. We understand that he is the one who is the, the king of the, the heaven, the king of the earth. And he is the one who created everything. And here the psalmist is crying, my life is going down. From words 6 to 9, we read, he sees God, it was the God who is actually putting him in this situation. We read here from 6, you have put me in the lowest part of the pit and your wrath weighs me heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have distanced my friends from me. He sees that in his life, God is in control. All that happens to his life, including suffering, it is not done without the knowledge of the most holy God. God is the one who is powerful. God is the one who is orchestrating everything in the world. So here he says, he sees the sovereignty of God in suffering. That God reigns supremely in his life. God is controlling his own life. Very often, when we encounter suffering, when we encounter unbearable pain in our life, we think God is not in control of our life. If God is there, definitely God would help me. We might doubt God's sovereign power when we walk through suffering. Psalms 115 verse 3 says, God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. God is in heaven. He is the creator God who does whatever he pleases in our lives, including believers' life. All that happens in our life is being orchestrated and the purpose of God. If you see the language of Job speaking in Job chapter 2, verse 10, he's speaking to his wife. You speak like a foolish woman speaks. He told her, should we accept only God, good from God and not adversity? He, he even understands that all that he is receiving, his suffering, his problems are from God. And now Paul E. Miller says in his book, A Praying Life, a lament connects God's promise with my present chaos, hoping for a better future. He says that God's promise and the present chaos, hoping for a 
better future. Now the psalmist, if you see, he is holding on to the promise of God. He is holding on to the Yahweh is his savior. And then he doesn't he doesn't stop there, but then he cries out to the Lord. He is coming and pouring out his heart. Lord, this is my situation. Prayer is a lament. This is what the Old Testament people say. You know, the lament is something that, you know, the New Testament, when we, when we are coming back, the Paul is lamenting. But sometimes, you know, church as believers, we might forget to lament very well. You know, sometimes when you come out and pour out within God, sometimes it looks like weakness, but then holding on to the promise of God and coming out with our own, with our own chaotic situation and trusting God for his, his, his hope to be done in our life. And secondly, we see here from 9b to 12, prayer and the glory of God. Lord, I cry out to you all day long. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do departed spirits raise up and praise you? Will your faithful love be declared in grave, your faithfulness in Abaddon? Will your wonders be known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of oblivion? Again, we see, we, we, again, like we saw in the verse 1, Heman cries back to the Lord all day, spreading out his hands to the Lord of lords and King of kings. He is nearing to the grave, but then his eyes is looking upon his Savior. Lord, help me once again. Do it once again. His faith is in the Lord despite his suffering. He brings four searching questions. If you wonder, what is that? He's coming with four questions, asking rhetorical, rhetorical questions. Do you work wonders for the dead, Lord? Do the departed spirits raise up to praise you? Will your faithful love be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in Abaddon? Will your wonders be known in the darkness of your righteousness in the land of oblivion? Actually, if you see the literary structure of this psalm, this is, this is called chiastic in nature, which is, you know, like a, like a sidewise V. The statement of chiasm is found in 9b and 10, which is, Lord, I cry out to you all day long, Spreading my hands to you, do you work wonders for the dead? Do departed spirits raise up and praise you? I remember a story when mom, my mom told me, when we were very small, my father was in deathbed about to die, and three of the children and, and my mom was there, and this was the last word my father spoke. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He was dying. He was on the deathbed. He was dying, but he was saying, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then that was the last word he spoke and he dead. In this psalm, if you are saying the motivation of the psalmist in this hopeless circumstances is, what is the motivation of the psalmist in this hopeless circumstance? He raises his hands all day long, crying out, asking Yahweh to preserve his life so that he can praise him. Lord, Lord, please deliver my life. Lord, the dead cannot praise you. As long as the person is alive, he can praise you. But the dead cannot do that. Dead cannot praise you, Lord. Lord, preserve my life. His purpose of living is to praise God and glorify the Lord of covenant. In the contrast to the experience of psalmist, the Lord has done wonders for the living in the past. He has been faithful. 
he has saved he has saved the israelites by faithful love so that the covenant people of god as a response to his grace they would praise the lord again and in psalm chapter 40 we see that narrative of uh, same thing now what's 9 and 10 we see i proclaim righteousness in the great assembly see i do not keep my mouth closed as you know lord i did not hide your righteousness in my heart i sp- spoke about your faithfulness and your salvation i did not conceal your constant love and truth from the great assembly the psalmist is asking the lord lord give me life so that i can glorify your name i can praise your name the dead cannot praise you lord you made the world to make this is what actually the argument of the psalmist is you made the world to make yourself known and enjoyed i know that and i enjoy you will that continue if i die and i am consigned to the grave lord help me preserve my life prayer is a means where we praise god where we worship god even at a time when we are sinking even at a time strengthless even at a time lightless even at a time when we are friendless lament a praising god or praying towards god is praising his holy name that he is adorable he is worshipful and the third one that we see here in the text is from 13 to 18 but i call to you for help in the morning my prayer meets you lord why do you reject me why do you hide your face from me from my youth i have been suffering a near death i suffer your horrors i am desperate your wrath sweep over me your terrors destroy me they surround me like waters all the day long they close in on me from every side you have distance loud ones a neighbor from me darkness is my only friend the psalmist is closer to the grave experiencing powerless and lightless and friendless yet striving his life to praise god and proclaiming his covenant grace and wonder but still in the tunnel of darkness now he comes again in the morning because he comes in the morning and and sees that lord your grace is new every morning lord i come to you today so that you will your grace will be more abounding in my own life but crying in anguish the psalmist feels the rejection of god in if you see in, in 13 and 14 if you see the rejection of god and his face hidden from him the psalmist feels the absence of god lord where are you i am not able to see you in my pain and suffering he acknowledges that god sovereignty again here he cries out to him helpless at the point of death looking for deliverance if we all see death is inevitable for everyone according to genesis chapter 3 all those who are born because we are sinners we have to experience the death but then here the psalmist is experiencing death because of loss of strength he is already in the threshold of death he is like a person who is a living dead have you ever come across in your own life have you seen people who are dying people who are in the edge of death who is really agonizing in pain and sorrow this is what the psalmist is trying to explain i am the edge of death he is not explaining death is something you know which is happening after that but he is living a life but experiencing death because of his sorrow and because of his pain 
and loss of strength. He says that he is completely engulfed by the adversities. He uses three words here: engulfed. He is like you know swept over, surround, and close in. All that he sees in his life is darkness. The darkness is surrounding in his life. Maybe you think that. Maybe brother Olson, I'm not. I'm not facing anything like this in my life. But there are people. There are people who are experiencing spiritual depression. There are people who are undergoing physical affliction and pain in this world. The body of Christ is there. to see that maybe you are undergoing to so much of so much of spiritual depression in your own life that you are not able to communicate and trying to hide in your self in a shell he says i am like a person who is shut in and i am not going out but here the psalmist is feeling the darkness everywhere in his life The psalmist ends this lament, but the faith triumphs. In all the situation, he men learned to look to God, who saves, even though he could not escape. But for the hope of circumstances, he looked to his Savior. Do you see some kind of similar darkness that came in the New Testament when Jesus was hanging on the cross? This is a parallel between the psalm and the sufferings of Jesus. This psalm is ultimately pointing towards Jesus. This psalm is directly pointing towards the one who is going to come and suffer the wrath of God. How do we know that? Read with me in Matthew chapter 26 verse Thirty-eight. He says, "Then he said to them, 'My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me.' And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, 'If it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will.'" Matthew twenty-seven forty-six says. and about the ninth hour jesus cried out my god my god why have you forsaken me if somebody is suffering a pain and sorrow like this this is just a glimpse of what our savior has suffered on the cross isaiah says it's a man of sorrow this sorrow was for what This sorrow is for yourself and for myself that he died on the cross taking up this punishment so that he could give us life in him so that we can see and we can praise God for eternity Jesus suffering on the cross is for yourself and for myself there are three applications from this psalm lament is worshipful but complaint is not the reason psalm 88 such a such a terrific psalm a person going to grave a person who's completely in darkness is written in the canon of scripture so that we would worship the lord with fullness of us can a depressed person sing to the lord yes the depressed person by reading a psalm and hearing him and worshiping him he can do that and there is a significant difference between a lament and a complaint we must be aware of what is what the lament is not a lament is always directed to the lord in faith but the complaint is directed towards man so this one such example is we see that in in numbers chapter 20 when they were running out of water the israelites 
directly went and started complaining towards the Lord. They did not trust in their Savior who brought them out of Egypt. But then they were going behind a man. But in today's psalm, we see that the psalmist, even though his situation is not favorable, his situation looks like everything has passed and hopeless, but his hope in Christ, hope in Yahweh, did not fail him at all. He caught hold of Christ within himself. And he says, so pray, pray in the word of God. If you, have, if you do not have the habit of praying, bring your prayers before the Lord. And one such prayer of gathering that we have is, you know, Friday morning prayer. You know, if you are having problem, unable to come and communicate, unable to, you know, do that, please come forward. There will be a group of people who are praying on the first floor. And the second thing is, second thing is, another difference is, the lament submits to the word of God, but complaint does not. Another example is, you know, in the Ruth, we see Naomi. Naomi and their, their husband Elimelech and two of their sons, they were going away from the promised land which is Bethlehem, they were going away from God. And, you know, going away from the Lord in Moab, children, you know, they died. She was so bitter. She is saying, the Lord has made me bitter. Her heart was filled with bitterness and sorrow. But then, her feet was returning towards the promised land. Do you see that? Lament is bitter, bitterful, you know, complaining against the Lord, but submitting towards Christ and His promise and His word. But complain is not. Secondly, we see the sovereignty of God in suffering. We, we saw already that will, will a godly man suffer? A person, a believer can suffer. A, a believer who believes in the word of God can suffer. One of the false concepts is a godly person did not have enough faith. That is the reason that he is suffering. It's because he did not have faith. He is suffering. But then the healing and deliverance is not because of the measurement of faith. It is because of the will of the Father in heaven. It is because of the sovereign God and who works according to his plan and purpose. And secondly, we see that in, in another false notion, that is, believers will never live with unanswered prayer. Many times, you know, believers are constantly praying, waiting for the Lord. Lord, will you not help me? Lord, will you not deliver me? I am waiting for so long for this prayer request. But then we see here, the Lord is silent. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6 to 10, we saw that Paul was asking, Lord, can you please help me? Remove this thorn from me. But the thorn was still there and it was painful for, for Paul. And Johnny Erickson Tada said in her book, one of her book, My wheelchair is my Ebenezer. She says that I am sitting in the wheelchair, unable to move myself for every Every details of my living, I need some kind of support. Without any support, I cannot do anything. But then she says, My wheelchair is thus for the Lord has helped me. And, and this Johnny Erickson Sada is, is one of the you know, minister today, you know, as you know, ministering you know, called, uh, in the website called Johnny and Friends in U.S., with disabled people proclaiming Christ's grace 
and wonder among the disabled people. The third one, an important one is, friendship is important for the lamenter, not preaching. As Christians, how do we walk with a depressed person? Jesus was isolated from his friends. They ran away. Heman's friends abandoned him during his suffering. Depressed soul needs sympathetic ears and patience and not preaching. At the same time, the depressed person also needs godly fellowship and reaches out for help within the gospel community so that you know, their questions, their pondering, their sufferings can be, can come to light because of God's grace and God's mercy. The one reason that we have the, the BSF or the Bible Study Fellowship is that we all walk together in this journey of faith, that we are not alone in the journey of faith in this land or wherever we are. So make use of the Bible Study Fellowship where we come together, discuss your problems, discuss your suffering and pray for one another that you may be strengthened in God's grace. The godly cries to the Lord in darkness of despair. Shall we pray? Father, we are so thankful that, Lord, you have given us life to praise you. We are so thankful that, Lord, our tongues praise you. Lord, our hearts rejoices you. Lord, because, Lord, you have given us life, we are not dead. Oh, Lord, there are people in this room who are agonizing. Lord, who are distressing in their, in their sorrow. Lord, help us to, Lord, say along with Paul, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Father, we pray that, Lord, you would go, give us hope in the gospel, hope in God, despite of the situation that is around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.